I'm Evan Zaplitsky, and I designed and developed this language called Elm. Um, and so this talk is going to be focusing on the aspects that are key to functional reactive programming. And I think this is an interesting topic, not just because it's a key part of Elm, but because uh, there are ideas there that are going to be useful in JavaScript or any sort of front end thing that you're working on. So even if you don't end up being like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm going to use Elm right now, uh, I think you'll come away with ideas and ways of structuring code that will help you out whatever language you're using. Um, and so uh, reactive is a term you've probably heard many different ways. This is a very particular version. Um, so we'll get into that. And just to motivate this a little bit, I want to show some examples of where we're going with this. So what, what can we do when we use functional reactive programming? So this is a small example of Mario who can walk around. Um, so he can walk and jump. And in this case, we're actually using the debugger. So we can have him go back in time as well. And we can change our program. Uh, it's better to make gravity weaker. It's much more fun. Um, and so you can see sort of how your programming has changed over time. And functional reactive programming is really all about how do we think about time? How do we think about events in a way that lets us sort of start to visualize it and program in a way that's more straightforward? And I know a lot of people aren't programming Mario each day at work. So as a more typical example, well, one thing I really like about FRP is that it makes active search quite easy. So in this case, this is like the uh, third party libraries for Elm. If I want to find something about random numbers, I can go and filter for that. Or if I want the standard libraries, I can go here. And again, if I'm like, OK, uh, I want to know about this function fold, you're filtering and sort of seeing in each library what function do I want to leave. And so the way this happens is all uh, based on function reactor program. And so we're going to dive into how that works and hopefully get to writing something like these uh, by the end of the talk. So. Um, for me, functional reactive programming sort of started from this idea of functional graphics. How can we approach rendering in a way that doesn't need something like the DOM, doesn't need something that has mutation? And if you've seen uh, Facebook's React or Ohm, it's along these same lines. How can you render without mutation? Um, and from there, very quickly, you get to reactive program. Functional, functional graphics. Uh, will get you like a picture, but you want that picture to interact with people. You want people to be able to click. Um, and so you react to that. And then we'll talk about how you can use these two things. So functional graphics and reactive programming may seem kind of like abstract things, but the real goal is to make them work in practice. So how do we write short, reliable code? And finally, how do we integrate this with JavaScript, whether that's using Elm in JavaScript or using these ideas in JavaScript? So the first thing. Uh, that sort of started this project was how can graphics be done in a better way? I was working on HTML and CSS and JavaScript at work. Sort of, I, I had been a server kind of person and ended up on this front end project. And I was just like, why is this so bad? Um, like, <laughs> I just wanted to vertically center something. I just, you know, I was like, oh, it's nice that it's in the middle. It'd be cool if it was also like vertically in the middle. And like, I can't understand how 20 years in, that's a hard thing to do. And like to figure out how to do it, you know, you find the blog post that has six entries of different approaches, and then it ends with like a comparison of those approaches, and it's like, well, option three is probably the best. And it's like, I just, like, the <laughs> <laughs> so I was frustrated with this. Um, and so the sort of key, uh, 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 inspiration was how, how to address this. And, and what that for me was sort of how can we think about making this more declarative uh, 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 and simpler. And, and what that entailed was uh, actually breaking up into different categories. So there's some kind of graphics that's text and links. And the way these flow on a page um, is sort of like the container size is kind of irrelevant. You just want to fill that space. And so in something like Word or LaTeX or some kind of uh, editing, document editing thing, you're not going to have a concept of vertical centering because it doesn't really make sense to say this paragraph is vertically centered between these other two. It's just like the way that this works is not about layout. Um, and so for HTML, uh, language for text markup, uh, 
it makes sense that this is something that doesn't really fit into the model very nicely. And so from there, you have this concept of layout where you have rectangles that you'd like to fit together in nice ways. And here, it's fairly straightforward to think about vertical centering or, or whatever kind of layout because you're working with rectangles, not flowing text. Um, and then finally, you have freeform graphics, which uh, sometimes rectangles aren't good enough. You really want that triangle to be rotated 10 degrees and then scaled, which doesn't really fit into the model of stack these on top of each other, layer them. So as a, let's take a look at what this would be like in practice. Um, so can people read, no, no. I was gonna say, can people read this? Can people read this now? Okay, cool. So as a simple example, we can say image 200 by 200, Yogi. Okay. And so what's happening here is main is what's getting shown on screen. So it has type element. Element is any rectangular visual element you can show. Um, and we're saying he has these dimensions, we're gonna show him. Um, let's name this and come back. You can also do some text. So Elm lets you do markdown blocks. So you can just include arbitrary markdown stuff. Um, so I can also show this. Um, so these are kind of two very basic primitives, like rectangular things that you can show on screen. Um, and it also shows this divide of like, sometimes we wanna talk about rectangles, sometimes we wanna talk about text, and the way we wanna do that isn't necessarily the same. So this gets more interesting when you start to use combinators on this. So I can say, I want these two things to flow down. So I wanna put yogi and then words um, and have them flow in a particular direction. And that can be down or up or right or inward, outward is better. Um, so you can sort of place these any way you want. And the sort of guiding example that I started with was how do you vertically center things? Um, so we can also say, I want a container that's 300 by 300, and in the middle of it, I want Yogi Bear. Like, y y you've gotten to a point where the thing that you'd like to express that's simple to say in English is also simple to say in code. Um, and so this is really where Elm got started. And uh, let's take a look at freeform graphics and then we'll get to what this leads to. So there are implications for using this approach that are, that are pretty neat. So we also have this idea of a collage. So this is a freeform surface where we can put any kind of shape we want. So I can say I want a collage, and in that collage I want a filled red <coughs> circle that's got a radius of 30. Um, and I can say, yeah, that's fine, but I also want a outlined solid blue rectangle that's 50 by 50. Um, and so you're starting to, in a very concise way, talk about much more complicated shapes and all in a composable way. So I can say I want to scale this by two. Suddenly we're scaled by two. So you get this very declarative way of describing the scene you actually like to show. Um, one interesting thing about this is that we can actually take any uh, element from before. So Remember here we had yogi and words. We can do the same thing here and say, and place this element in the freeform context and use the same kind of uh, functions to place it in the screen. So rather than having uh, one abstraction to rule them all, we have a couple that are particularly guided to doing the right thing in the right uh, context. So. Uh, this is nice for laying things out, but you may have noticed that none of these things move. None of these things react to people. Um, and this is actually where I found myself early on designing this, where I was like, oh, cool, like, I can do layout in this, like, functional way, but 
like I can't click on it, I can't react to things, I can't remember anything. And so that's when uh, functional or reactive program programming comes in. And so the way to think about this is uh, control flow for events. So uh, there was a time when people programmed with go-tos. Like your, the way you would think about your program would be you have this giant chunk of text and you hop between it. And in your mind, you try to keep track of the state of everything that's going on there. Um, and when it comes to event-based programming, it's quite similar to how it was uh, at that time, where you have a big chunk of text and through callbacks and promises, you're sort of hopping around to different parts. So the structure of your code doesn't give you very good hints about the structure of your actual application. And so reactive programming is about saying, okay, I want to talk about events, I want to talk about time, so I'm going to provide structures and sort of like language support for those kinds of features. So um, how I think about this in Elm is at the end of the day, we want someone to be able to see stuff on their screen. Um, and what our application is doing is taking their input from keyboard, mouse, or clicks on screen, and we're doing some stuff and putting it on screen. Um, and so what functional reactive programming is about is sort of having a nice pipeline and a nice way of handling those events in a, in a coherent way. Um, and so in Elm, that means we always start with some input. This is representing some user interaction, uh, a way to transform that input. So take a mouse position and turn it into something else, um, and a way to update state. So a way to remember what has happened before and show that on screen as well. Um, and so what will happen in your programs is you get this very nice structure that's quite linear. The program you write is input, transform, update state, show it on screen. And you're not having a sort of mess of, okay, now I have a callback in my view, and there's some state in my view, and slowly all of these distinct parts become one part that melds together. Um, so let's look at this in a bit more detail. So first you have input. So I think this is best shown by example. Um, so the first one we'll see is mouse position. Let's just take a look at it. So as I move my mouse around, uh, the value of mouse position is updating. So, <laughs> so when you think of what, the val what is mouse position, it is the current position of the mouse, whatever that happens to be. So it's not just a value, it's a value that's changing over time. Um, and we'll get into more detail about what these two are doing. So as text is just taking anything and showing it on screen. Um, so we're saying, okay, I want to see mouse position. Um, so think of this as a value that is changing over time. So it's not just a pair of integers, but it's a pair of integers that's changing as the world changes. Now, that's not enough. It's not enough to be able to talk about the world as it's changing, but we need to be able to react to that. So the first way we do that is with, uh, by transforming them. And so this is called lift in Elm. You can think of it as map or uh, yeah, map is a nice name as well. So what you're saying is take a signal of A's, some value A, convert that A to a, convert that A to a B, and give out a signal of B's. So that may mean take uh, mouse positions, uh, do some transformation, and give out the result of that transformation. So you're getting a new signal uh, defined in terms of the other one. And so when new events come in, they're transformed, and the events keep going along. So if we go back to this example, it may make a little more sense now. So we're taking a signal of integer pairs, and we're saying take this as text function that can take anything and give us back an element. And Lyft is just saying, all right, do this for signals. So as things update, my screen will update. Now this gets more interesting when you start to apply it to these programs we saw before. So let's say we say this is a scene x, y. Oops. So one thing we can do is say uh, for 400, oops, 400, 200, just as some value. And we can start using these variables in how we define our view. Um, so we can say, I don't want to scale this by 2. I want to scale it by x over. 100. So whatever I put in as my x value will influence this. And so this gets at one thing, which is that uh, you get this nice sort of componentization of your view. 
in that because you're in a full Turing complete language as opposed to HTML or CSS, you actually can start making abstractions and uh, saying, okay, I'm gonna define this view in terms of this one piece of data. In, in this case, maybe the mouse position. So what we can do here is we say lift our scene instead of onto a particular number, onto mouse.position. And we need to import that. So now as I move across the screen, we get to see that increase in size. And so what's great about this is that the code to view this is just a description of take the data, this is what it looks like. Um, and we're not going to Canvas or DOM and changing things and saying, oh, this one moved, I need to change that state there. Um, you get a very simple way of specifying these things. Um, and when you pair that with the uh, sort of modularity of this setup, you can start to be a bit more tricky. So we can also do something with, uh, let's rotate it by uh, Y. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Yes. Oh, okay, cool. So, <laughs> so it becomes very easy to make complicated interactions in, in a straightforward way. And so this is just a, you know, this isn't an application that you'd write, but this is illustrating the idea of once you have these tools of uh, functional graphics and reactive programming, it becomes a very concise way to start talking about these things. Um, so, okay, so we've seen Lyft, but there's a, another version of it. So many applications depend on more than one input. There are very few things that depend just on mouse position. Um, so Lyft 2 is giving us the ability to take two different signals, signal of A's and a signal of B's, combine them into a signal of C's. So you can take keyboard input, mouse input, HTTP input, all kinds of inputs, and combine them together into one view at the end of the day. Um, so that could mean, uh, let's just do it. Let's just see an example of that. Um, so our scene could also take a width and height. And so instead of saying lift, I say lift two with window dot dimensions. And so window dimensions is another signal that as the page changes size, its value updates. Um, so now I can say, now I can say import window and see that on screen. So uh, a useful thing to do would be to actually use it. So now the size of my collage is the size of my screen. And so when I resize, uh, my canvas is going to resize as well. And again, the cool thing is that you get the separation between view and logic. So there are lots of other lifts, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then we kind of stop at eight because it's like, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> so hopefully you don't get to that number. There, 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 <laughs> something's probably going wrong if you've gotten to eight. Um, so finally, we have a way to update state. So we saw this changing moving square, but it only was reacting to the present. It was like a Zen program where it had no memory of what had gone before. It didn't really matter. It's just like if someone had clicked 10 times, there's no way to know that. So the way we do that in Elm is this, uh, it's, a, it's a variation of fold. So depending on how much functional programming you've done, you may have seen fold L. This means fold from the left, uh, and fold R is fold from the right. So you're taking a list of things or array of things and going and accumulating them all. Um, so Elm introduces fold P. This is fold from the past. So it's the same sort of thing. As events come in on this signal of A's, I'm taking each A, the current accumulated value, and updating that value. So if I want to count mouse clicks, I'd have click events coming in here, and I'd start at zero. And my function would say, take the click event, take the current count, increment it. And so what I'm getting out of this is some representation of state as my program goes through. Um, so we'll see this a bit more in a second. Uh, so together you get this 
fairly straightforward pipeline of like how you can deal with events and how they flow through your program. So at no point are you saying go change that, go do that. You're very, it's, it's a much more declarative way of saying uh, this is what it looks like when I render this thing or this is the transformation that I want to do at this time. Um, and I should also point to, there's a, the original paper on this is called Functional Reactive Animation. Um, there was a brief like three day period where I thought I invented this. Um, I was like looking at these shapes that wouldn't move at all and was like, what if they values change over time? And it was, and I was just like, I was like, ah, it changes everything. Um, and then like later found that I was like 14 years late. So, <laughs> uh, okay, so what does this look like when you're actually writing code? So um, early on with Elm, a lot of the things people made were games. So as we saw with the sort of freeform graphics, uh, it's quite easy to make shapes and pictures and words sort of in an arbitrary way. Um, and so what's been surprising is that games were like the easy part. Um, and so a lot of people have explored this. We'll be looking at one in a moment. Um, the other thing that Elm is good for now is more traditional web apps. So like making your to-do list and your forms and your buttons and the kinds of things that people do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and what was interesting about making this jump was that uh, uh, text fields are, are complicated. Like I, I, it's, it's hard to appreciate that like, it's very, very tricky. We'll look, we'll look into that a bit as well. So what I'd like to do is start with a sort of very basic framework for making Mario that sort of stripped out all of the interesting parts and sort of try to build up and sort of get into the logic of programming in this style. So what I have in here now is a model of what it means to be Mario. Um, and so that is a position and a velocity. He's a very simple man. Uh, and uh, I have a dis some display code. And so this part I've written because it's not super interesting. It's like draw the ground, draw the sky, draw Mario. Um, and what I'm showing on screen is uh, show him, show Mario with this dimensions of the screen. So. What we'd like to do is to make him react to keyboard and time and so he can move around like we saw in the demo early on. Um, so I would like to start with that by, we need inputs, like we need to be able to talk about the world. So let's say our first input is FPS 30. So we want to look at, and this double dash is the syntax for comments. Um, so when we compile this, we see these are time deltas coming at shooting for a frame rate of 30 frames per second. So uh, 34 or 35, if you multiply it by 30, should be about 1,000, I hope. Um, and so what that means is we're getting events coming in that's saying this much time has passed, react to this. Um, and so what we need to do from there is start to say, okay, time is passing, we need to update Mario with physics or gravity to make him actually move. So uh, if we look at this function, what we're doing here is we're taking our render function from before, and we're saying the first thing I want to give it is window dimension, so it actually fills the screen rather than some subpart. And I want to give uh, this stateful version of Mario. So I'm going to take my input, and each time that changes, I'm going to use this step function to take Mario as he is now and turn him into the Mario who he aspires to be. Um, and so Fold P is sort of taking care of these details of carrying the state as you go through. So as it is now, we can compile this. And it's not so interesting. So we're getting these time deltas coming through. And we're applying our step function to Mario. And the step function ignores everything and gives you back the same Mario as before. So this is problematic. Uh, so now we're getting in a time delta. And we want to update Mario in some way. So let's start out with. Uh, physics. We want to say take some time delta t and we take a Mario and I want a new Mario where his x position is Mario dot x plus t times Mario dot vx. So we're taking his current position 
his velocity and sort of stepping him based on your time delta. Um, and we want to do this for y as well. OK, so we update our program, uh, and we don't see anything different. And this is because I forgot to actually apply the function. Six time delta Mario. OK, so we recompiled again, and still we don't see anything. Um, does anyone see off the bat why this is? OK, he has no velocity. So let's give him a velocity. <laughs> so this is a good start. This is a good start. And I think this I think this kind of works on its own. Like already I think we're at something that like I I like to look at at least. <laughs> and we I think that's I think we won. <laughs> Um, so, so we're missing some things. Uh, I think that's how I would interpret this. We're missing some stuff. Um, so another thing we want to do is not just be able to talk about physics, but also interact with the keyboard. So our problem is that our input is only talking about time. We need to be able to incorporate keyboard input to that as well. So I'm going to write some, some things here and explain them in a moment. Uh, OK, so again, let's look at our. Let's just look at our input. So what this is saying is take our input and show it on screen on its own. So we have that same jittery time delta as before, but now we have this extra record with an x and a y in it. So when I press up, you see it go up. And when I press down, it goes y goes negative one, left, right. You have to trust me that I'm pressing these things. I, I am. Um, so we have a representation of what the arrows are. What what is the sort of how do we represent the arrows at the, at this moment in time? Um, and so now that we have this, we can start typing that through to our step function. And this should be a type error, which is great, because now when we're passing in our input, it's not just a time delta. It's a time delta and uh, the directions from our keyboard. Uh, so we were trying to multiply velocity times like a thing that doesn't multiply. Like. Um, so now that we have a way to talk about directions, let's make him walk. So I want to take a direction and a Mario, and I want, uh, I want a new Mario where his x velocity is This right? Oh, I forgot to apply the function. <laughs> There's something about this example where I just like can't remember to actually put in the step function. Um, so let's see what happens when I press the buttons. Okay, so we got Mario walking around. We're able to set his uh, x velocity, and thanks to our physics function, that actually means when he has an x velocity, he like moves in that direction. Um, and we can set this to something more reasonable, such as. It's much more realistic, I think. <laughs> um, so we have a way to walk. We have a way to physics. Let's add a way to jump. So again, we care about our keyboard input. Mario where vy is up. OK, this isn't actually what we want. We, we don't want him to just like always be jumping. We don't, we don't want him to be able to jump down if the user presses down. Um, we we want to be able to say if the direction, the y direction, is greater than zero. So if someone's pressing up, then we want to mess with his velocity. Otherwise, we just want Mario back. We don't, you know, we just like him how he is. So now, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we apply our jump function, crucial, to use the functions you write. Um, and it works. We have him walk around. And when he jumps, <laughs> he flies away. So we're doing really well now. Um, I think you could win a traditional Mario game with this behavior. 
where you just start it and you jump, and then you just like press forward and like move till you get to the end of the level. Um, though I don't know if that will be the most fun way to play Mario. So let's try. Uh, we need to add one last thing. Weirdly, Mario really needs gravity. It somewhat counterintuitive to like a game like this. It's like simulating gravity is really important. Um, so we want Mario where uh, my V Y is updated based on uh, on his current velocity. So he's got some velocity. Maybe that's a high. It's going up at like a rate of five, and we want that to slowly slow down until his velocity gets to zero at the peak, and then goes negative, and he's coming down. So we can just uh, subtract some ratio of time. That's, that's maybe too much. And again, he is applying it. OK, so we have gravity now. Did everyone see, did everyone see Mario there? Totally, totally working. Um, OK, so we found a bug in our physics function. We, we, we found out that this isn't really how physics works for Mario. He can't move in any direction at any time. We want to say Mario's y, velocity, y position is bounded. Um, so I'm going to do a trick where his new position is going to be the maximum of 0 or some updated value. So now when Mario is on the ground, physics says, you should stop. You should stop here. Um, OK, OK, more gravity. 10 times more gravity? No. So this is where it gets fiddly. This is where the debugger is nice, where you can kind of like play with the values. Um, OK, that's fine. That's fine. Um, it's not fine. I'm not happy with this. Yeah, no. OK, one last one. This is it. This is the one. No, 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 no. OK. Fine. OK, good. Now, there's a problem here. <laughs> so again, this is like the ideal way to play Mario, <laughs> where it's like everyone's marching around, and you can kind of like buzz them, you know, like, oh, yeah, you thought you were going to get me? No. Um, so, so there's a problem again. Um, so in this case, does anyone see, see where things went wrong? Um, We've got an issue where we can just jump at any time we want ever. Right. So when we have our jump function, we're saying, are they pressing up? Which is a fairly lax requirement for whether you should jump. It's just, if you want to jump, yes, you are, you are permitted. Um, it'd be cool if, that was a, if physics let that happen. Um, but we also need to say uh, Mario, his y position is equal to 0. So in this case, we're stuck on the ground. And we might even not be jumping high enough to jump over anything at all. It's kind of the sad reality of Mario. Um, OK, so what happened here is uh, we took uh, sort of a very basic, here's how you show some Mario thing on screen. And we sort of began adding reactivity to that sort of a, 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 as a gradual process. And the code we ended up with to actually do that um, breaks up really nicely into modular parts. So we can think about physics and walking and jumping and gravity as separate things uh, and compose them together to get the behavior we want. Um, and so as things get more complicated, you'll use the same style of composition to uh, uh, build up more and more complex programs. And the cool thing about this is that throughout this whole process, we never messed with the renderer. Um, and one result of that is that things are kind of weird when he walks around, right? Like this isn't. No one walks like, like without moving their legs. Um, so what we can do now is start to update our render function to include sort of the model of Mario. Knowing what we know about Mario, how can we render him in a better way? Um, so we can say, uh, uh, let's give him a verb. And so I've set up GIFs such that this will work out nicely. Verb. Uh, so if Mario dot y is greater than 0. So if he's jumping, then his verb is jump. 
Uh, and this is the syntax in Elm for a multi-way if, so you can do a bunch of different possibilities. Um, so if Mario.vx is not equal to zero, that means he's not standing still, he's moving in some direction or another, then he's walking. Otherwise, he's standing. And so the way this is gonna work is like, we'll go on the first branch that hits. So the first thing that's true. Um, so that means if he's jumping and moving in one direction or another, jumping comes first. So he's not like jumping like a maniac. Um, so now we have him like walking around. Ah, oh, man. So the best part of this is walking backwards. I want to script in like some Michael Jackson here. <laughs> um, but we can, we can improve that as well. So uh, we also have some information about what direction he's going. If Mario dot VX is less than zero, so if he's going negative velocity, then he's going to the left, else he's going to the right. And we can add this in. And now he appears to be walking in the right direction. And again, this wasn't touching update. This wasn't touching our model. This is just dealing with our renderer. Now, there's one bug left with this. It's kind of a subtle one. Um, so let's say he walks to the left and he stops. He just turns around immediately. Um, and so this shows a flaw with our model, right? So like if we want to make it so he stays facing the direction, um, early on we said Mario is just his position and his velocity. He is a, a hunk of pixels that just moves through space. Um, but in reality, we actually want to remember things about him. So what way was he facing last? Um, and so in a, in a different model, what one might do is say like, ah, I'll just like hack it in there in my display. It's not really core to what it means to be Mario. Um, and suddenly your model is in your view and your update is in your view because it matters like how these things flow through your program. And so what's cool about how this works in Elm is it, you, you must phrase things in a way where your model display and uh, update are all separate. So what we could do is add in some memory of direction, update our update code, and then use that in our renderer. So you, the model encourages you to structure your programs in the way that you would structure your programs if you were like thinking it through. So I find with a lot of the Elm programs I write, I'll like hack it together and I'm like, ah, oh, I just want this to work. And then like it finally works. And I'm like, oh, like if I had planned ahead, this is what I would have written. Like if I had been a smarter me, that's what I would have wanted. And sort of this comes from thinking about things in this reactive way where your dependencies actually show up in your code. So uh, let me see what, how much time I have. Okay, okay. Um, so another thing it, we would want to look at is, so Mario is cool, but Mario isn't what we do every day. So how do these lessons apply in a, in a setting that's like check boxes? Okay. Okay, so there's something weird with rendering. But so I have these three synced check, check boxes. I click one and they all change. Um, and so what's going on here is I'm sort of, I'm committing to the structure that we saw early on. I have inputs, I update my state, and I show that on screen. Um, so what's happening here is when I say display boxes, I'm saying take whether or not they should be checked and give me back an element. So our view is still uh, uh, a purely functional thing I'm saying take in what the checkboxes should be, give me something I'll show on screen. And when we actually do that, um, we create a checkbox. The first thing we say is I want to not attach a callback, but I want to say I report to this input. I report to the check input. So when an event happens here, send it to this input at the top of my program, and that'll flow through. Um, and finally, uh, the things coming through this input this signal event is going to display boxes. So there's a bit of like loopiness here, um, but what it means is that your view is still a pure function. Um, so what's cool is that I can just say box 
box, add a bunch of them, and these all work nicely. So we just defined one version of this box thing. But because we're talking about a data structure, um, it's fine to copy it around. And if you tried to do something like this in the DOM, uh, it would remove old versions of itself. It, it, what it, need, it is carrying state. It'd be carrying state about what this checkbox is doing. Um, and so you couldn't do things in this composable way. Um, they would delete each other. So uh, this is a bit subtle uh, how this works, um, but I think it gives you a very nice architecture just like in the Mario kinds of programs. So um, here's another one that the code is not super huge. Essentially, we're saying here's how I show it on screen, here's how I define a field, and here's how I reverse text. Um, and what this is doing is saying, uh, let's zoom in a bit, uh, desserts, race car, uh, bats. <laughs> so each of these fields is updating the other. So like if we delete this and say, uh, uh, no, that's not one of them. Um, <laughs> But we can start to sort of like see how these things fit together. And we're using a model where when I type into one of these fields, it comes to the top of my program and I process them explicitly. So I'm not getting any callbacks or state in my view. Um, and one neat thing about this debugger is you can go back through what they have typed. Um, so this is a fairly new thing, but what this could mean, what, what we're imagining for this is that you can start doing testing uh, based on sequences like this. So you could get a bug report that is, take this sequence that I did, and that's how you get to the bug. And so the programmer would go and say, okay, I run it, and yep, I see that bug, and they can fix it and see what happens. Um, or if you, maybe if you wanna do testing, you can get a bunch of sequences that you know you wanna behave in a particular way, um, and make sure they always have the same result. Uh, one last one, so this is a more uh, based on the to do MVC model. So I can say milk, drink milk, buy more milk, repeat, um, and get rid of these things. And this is all based on the same model of I start with my inputs, I update my model, there's a way to view that model on screen. Um, so at this point, uh, when it comes to front end GUI stuff, uh, I, I think this model covers it in a, re in a really nice way. And uh, how this is playing out in uh, Elm community and Prezi, actually, uh, let's, yeah, this, okay, there's a slide for that. So how, how do you start to integrate with this uh, in, in the real world? How do you start using this in a company or in a project of yours or whatever? Um, and so recently we introduced this idea of the component model. Um, so you can use Elm just where you want it, where it's a good fit, uh, to experiment with it and leave the rest of your application intact. So hopefully you can see these boxes, but imagine a sort of like somewhat typical web app where you have a search bar, you have some kind of like options or menu, and you have search results. Um, and these are all gonna be interacting with each other in some way. Um, and perhaps you wanna say, I wanna write this little piece in Elm. The rest might be JavaScript or ClojureScript or TypeScript or some other script. Um, and this shouldn't sort of mess up your application. So the structure we came up with is uh, because Elm is event-based, we have these strong uh, interfaces on either side of an Elm program called ports where you can send events in. So you may have incoming ports where someone changed their search query and I wanna react to that. Um, and we have outgoing ports where, where uh, I incremented a counter that uh, the search results care about or I set a filter option that the search results care about. And so what this means is that when you wire this up to the rest of your program, you get a very clean separation of concerns where this component is in charge of its own state, independent of the search bar, independent of anything else in the application. And when you want to interact with it, you're going through these strong APIs on either end. Um, and so this is the kind of thing we're experimenting with it at Prezi where uh, this is similar to sort of a micro architecture on server side where you can write little microservices uh, that can be in whatever language. Um, and you can use the best language for your team or the, the project you're working on or whatever. Um, 
And another nice result of this is that this is actually a nice way to structure larger applications as well, where you actually do want to enforce this kind of modularity in a way that in just sort of plain uh, JS and HTML would be quite hard to do. You end up with state in your view and you're reaching all around. And so changing one little component may be breaking five other things that you've never seen before. So the way this is played out in sort of like publicly released stuff in Elm community stuff uh, is a uh, diagram. So this is a guy who was thinking about how to beat his grandmother in the German version of Parcheesi. And so he would do all these simulations of like, how do I optimally choose a strategy to move around the board? And so he would embed animations of like, what are the safe and dangerous places? Uh, green was safe, right? Um, and so this was a nice way to see like using Elm for the particular part where it was a really good fit or where you're curious about using it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's functional reactive programming in Elm. Thanks. Uh, there's a microphone uh, coming your way. Yeah, I, I'm just curious. When, when Mario was walking, yeah. uh, was that an animated GIF or was there something in state that went over my head so I could like That was the animated GIF, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the, the, huh? Say what? So it was, I would just have to animate, you have to stop animating. Yeah, so essentially how collage is working is when you embed a uh, element, It'll just display it as normal. So if you display an animated GIF, it's going to be doing whatever it happened to be doing. Um, but yeah. Yes? Is um, Elm's goal in the coupling of graphics, um, is, is it useful outside of graphics programming? Like, could you use it as a general purpose programming language to target JS? So this is I something. Mean, with like, uh, language, like yeah, so this is something we've been working on improving recently. So I've been really careful to keep a focus where I don't get sort of like lost in, well, this could be good for robotics, this could be good for like music. Um, and so I've been focusing primarily on graphics, but recently you're able to export uh, functions from Elm and use them in whatever JavaScript code you want, whether that's on in browser or like on Node or something like that. So the kind of use case I'm thinking of would be you wrote a parser in a, in a nice way, that a nice like Haskell style parser or something like this, and you'd like to use it in JavaScript because regular expressions can't do HTML or something like this, um, exporting, exporting that kind of thing. There are other questions of like, would you want to run on server or like, and I think when it comes to, applying FRP or functional reactive programming to a particular domain, um, it gets more subtle uh, in that the way it's framed in Elm is really great for graphics, but it may not be the best for like a server side thing. Um, and so you have to be careful when you're choosing there. Are there 3D, 3D leverage? Um, in the, like give it like three weeks. So yeah, so there's a guy in, uh, in New York who's, who's been working on the project since early on, and he was like, I want to do WebGL. And I didn't want to like, lose focus on uh, buttons and forms and sort of like the practical use case, so he finally got the WebGL bindings. And I, talking with him, I was really shocked how like, simple it can be. And I, it's like simple in the sense that 3D is complicated, but like this is not, there's no extra complexity. So that should be coming out, I'd say, I'd say a month is the time frame for that. <laughs> yes? So with the checkboxes, regular DOM elements, or check, DOM checkboxes, or no? Yeah. Because it seemed like every other one was a little slightly different height. Yeah, sure. there was something weird with um, when you zoom the page in, they were getting a little weird. Okay. That might be that might be a renderer bug. I'm not sure. That might be my fault. I'm not, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yes. Has this been used in any like board production code? Um, so at this stage, uh, we're still experimenting with it. So at Prezi, we're uh, internally using using it to write small components, um, and 
what we're trying to do is like, is this uh, nice to do? Is it better to do? Kind of assess these questions right now. So the ultimate goal is yes, but in terms of like large production stuff, it's not there yet. Is That's Elm it. able to take input for, by making REST calls? Can you grab data from the server? Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a HTTP library that lets you call out to a server. And one interesting thing about how function reactor programming works in Elm relative to things like reactive extensions or a lot of the other imperative things that you might see in JS is that um, it has a built-in synchronization method. So you can get situations in Rx where things can get a little bit out of order. Um, and Elm is designed such that you by default have synchronization and you can add in points of asynchrony. Um, and so in the theoretical model of it, like the one that could be done, um, you could actually do this for anything. So if you have a long running computation, you could just tag it as it's okay if these events get out of order and run that in parallel or in some other way. The trouble is that JavaScript support for concurrency is you know, that's like, it's not a thing, really. Um, like, you do have web workers, but they're, I'm, I'm off topic now. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so I want to add to the use in production. So the, the way this is, this project has sort of been set up, um, I was hired by Prezi about, a year ago now, and my explicit goal was take this idea and get it in shape for production ready. And over the last, like, I'd say four or five months, it's been like, I've been really, really happy with the progress that's been made. And I'm start, I'm like near a point where I'm like, yeah, use it in production. Uh, and I, I only, I only hesitate because I know we're going to get there and I don't want people to like try early in like production environment and get bitten by it. Um, but when it comes to doing a small experiment on a component, I think it's like a it's a good time to try try that kind of thing. Yes. So uh huh. Does that imply that um, Brown is constantly processing, or does it have conditions so that it knows when it's going to branch or something like that? Yeah. So there's a version of FPS called FPS. Yes, when, where you give it a true or false, and it'll turn on and off. Um, but yeah, figuring out how to turn those on and off in a nice way is a little bit tricky at the moment. But yeah, this is something we we care about. So yeah, and for rendering, you are doing this kind of clever stuff. So if if you've seen Reactor Ohm, it's the same kind of strategy where when you get something you want to show on screen, that's going to be going to Elm's renderer which says, no one's looking right now. I'm not going to bother. Um, and so you're saving that kind of work. Um, yes. Very far back there. Say again. Does it support Canvas for HTML5 or is it applied? Yeah, so uh, early on, I, I decided that I was going to I was going to say like modern browsers. Um, so it goes as early as IE9. Because to like on some level, modern browsers means like not IE8 or lower. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so things like Canvas and the HTML5 stuff is all there. Um, I'm curious about accessibility with Elm. Yeah. And are the pages accessible to screen readers and stuff like that? Right. So this. There are two versions of this answer. One is that Elm usually generates no script tags. So when you have a text heavy page like uh, uh, kind of like this or like this kind of thing, it's going to generate sort of a best effort at uh, no script tags. Um, and that can all be done statically. The compiler isn't quite clever enough to do it all super well. Um, the other thing is that. My understanding is that screen readers aren't so dumb as they once were. Um, that doesn't mean this is an unimportant issue um, because lots of people surf the web without JavaScript. Um, but I, my understanding is that for a lot of uh, like screen readers, 
um, they're able to run JavaScript and read what's what's happening with that. Is that a, a acceptable answer? <laughs> You, you showed uh, the interaction between Elm and other JavaScript components using a port. Yes. How does that work? Um, let me find an example of that. Uh, 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 Elm. I don't, uh, one sec. There it is. So can anyone see this at all? Probably not. So what you can do is, let's say you create an Elm module called stamps. You can initialize it in a bunch of different ways. One is a full screen, one is embedded in a div, and another is embedded as a worker, so you don't actually have the render as part of it. And then you can pass in through these ports uh, different values. So maybe that's configuration stuff or signals that are gonna be changing. And then when you're dealing with that in JavaScript, you're saying, like, I created my stamps module, my stamps component, and I'm going to send reset, uh, send this value to the reset port, or I'm going to listen to, like, a, a count of events from it. Um, and so from JavaScript, you're really just saying, send this thing, subscribe to that, and use a function to deal with it. Um, so this one isn't the most beautiful thing, but, uh, Essentially, the stamping part is an Elm program, and this count is happening in JavaScript. And so when I say reset, I'm sending an event into my Elm program. It's reacting to that, uh, and the JavaScript is just doing what it will do, stateful stuff and whatever. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, um, under the covers all this is DOM and JavaScript. So has anybody wrapped this in a Cordova phone gap environment? Not that I know of. But yeah, uh, the runtime and the, it would be possible. Um, I'm not a major expert on, on Cordova, but uh, yeah, at the bottom it's like JavaScript and DOM manipulation. Yeah. Thanks. Hmm? Uh, the, you know, supports the uh, yeah. Yeah, so there's a touch library. There's a really, uh, there's this German guy who used to do demo, demo scene stuff. So like, he'll always do the coolest stuff with Elm that I didn't really, like he'll be like, hey guys, check out this thing I did. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not possible. Um, <laughs> and so he did one with touch, uh, touch screen where he could sort of resize an arbitrary shape and kind of like warp it in different directions. But yeah. Okay, any last? Okay, cool, thank you guys.